Hi everyone, I am trying to give an introduction to measure theory here. The purpose of this video primarily is to help me study for my midterm tomorrow, but I figured I would uh, post it online just so that anybody else who finds it useful could also uh, watch. So, um, measure theory, at least the way I'm going to present it, is going to be motivated by, um, by a, a rather simple problem, which is finding the integral of the Dirichlet function. So the Dirichlet function is this function on, um, it only needs to be defined on this, on the interval from 0 to 1 or any other interval you want. So we'll just define it on the interval from 0 to 1. Here's the, the real line, but it will maybe defined uh, on, on, on that interval. So here's 1, here's 0. And the Dirichlet function is, looks like this. If x is going to be 1, if x is rational, that is, if x is in the set q. And it's going to be 0 otherwise, that is, it's going to be 0 if x is irrational. So it's the, uh, it's the characteristic function of, of the set q of irrational numbers, if you will. Now what does that function actually look like? It's going to have, you know, every rational number, like one half and three quarters, and one itself and zero itself. All of these, you know, one third or, or one sixth, one third, two thirds, five sixths, whatever else, all of these rational numbers are going to be in the set or are going to have a, a value of one. But then all these irrational numbers are going to have a value of zero. And so there are even though there are infinitely many of both, there are uncountably many irrational numbers and countably many rationals. So I'm trying to sort of reflect that in the way that I draw this function. And if you were to actually take the integral from 0 to 1 of this function, what do you think it should be? Let's, let's just say I were to ask you to take the integral from 0 to 1 of the Dirichlet function with respect to x. What, what, what answer do you expect? Well, there are so, so many more irrational numbers and rational numbers, I mean, we're talking countable versus uncountable, that surely, if an integral were to find, the integral would be 0. It wouldn't be 1. It wouldn't be anything between 0 and 1. It would just be 0, because it's basically just like throwing up little points, you know, countably infinitely many, but we still have so many down here. But the problem is, th this is not Riemann integrable. Not integrable if you're using the Riemann understanding of integral. So that's a problem because we know that it should be zero, but the Riemann integral just doesn't give us that. So I'm going to define uh, Lebesgue measure, and it's going to be actually more complicated than you might think. Um, and I'm going to define it w with the kind of motivation in mind of trying to come up with an integral that actually will give us this. And it should hopefully be a generalization of the Riemann integral. Um, but we want our Lebesgue, we, we want a, a way to actually uh, come up with the answer here. And here's what we're actually going to do. It, it's basically, it's going to say that the measure of this set, uh, the measure of the irrational numbers uh, on, on this interval, have measure 1. And then the points that are 1 have measure 0. And the integral, you might be able to guess, would hopefully, once we've defined it, would assign a a, a value of 1, the height of this thing, multiplied by the measure where it actually takes on 1, plus 0 multiplied by the measure where it actually takes on 0. So, so here we would have 1 times 0 plus 0 times 1. I hope that, that's clear that the 1 here represents the height at uh, on the irrational numbers, or sorry, the height on the rationals, and then this right here represents the measure of the irrationals, and of course I haven't shown that the measure of the of the rationals is zero, but uh, you can imagine it, it might it would be likely since it's countable. And then here is the uh, we've got the height at the irrationals and the measure of irrationals. So that's how we're going to define uh, the big measure, or that's how we're going to sort of def an intuitive uh, first look at how we will define. Uh, the Lebesgue integral, but of course we're going to have to figure out what measure actually means. So let's talk about that. But let's not talk about the Lebesgue integral just yet. Let's just talk about what is a measure to begin with. 
Well, what sorts of properties do we want a measure to have? What, what kind of thing is it to begin with? Is it another good question to start with? Well, it should be some kind of function, and it assigns values, uh, values between 0 and infinity. I guess a set could have infinite measure if it's infinitely long. So it should be a function, to, and we'll call this, this function mu, measure, from something to, and I guess something could have a length of 0, but certainly not anything less than 0. And it could have an infinite length, sure. So a function from what? The in this case we'll just work over over the real numbers. Well, you know, we could define this on R n, we could define it on any set. But let's just for now start out by talking about the real numbers. And it's going to be a set from the power set of the reals. At least perhaps we could think of it that way. We'll see in a little bit why that can lead to some problems, but for now it's okay to think of it this way. That it assigns every set assigns every subset of R a non negative value. This non negative value could be considered its length. Because measure is really intended to be a generalization of the idea of length. Now, what sorts of properties do we think that measure should have? Well, one property that, that should certainly occur is that the measure of the empty set is zero. What's the length of the empty set? It has nothing in it. Of course, its measure needs to be zero. Another property is that if E and F are both subsets of R, and E and F are disjoint, then the measure of E union F should just be the measure of E plus the measure of F. That seems reasonable, right? If we take a subset of the real line, so here's our, our real line, and then here's um, the little bit of real line, and then here's E. That should be on the real line, I guess, but I'm, I'm drawing it just above the real line. Let me actually put that down on the real line. Here's E, and we'll just have that be a boring interval right now. And then F will be, oops, I guess E is orange. And F will be light green, I suppose. And maybe F is a little bit more interesting. It has, it's just two separate open intervals. But the uh, the measure of E union F should be the measure of E plus the measure of F, right? If we, if we want to figure out the measure of that whole thing, we just add the, the pieces together because they're disjoint. And of course, that's not going to be true if their if their union is uh, not empty, or at least if their union has a positive measure, because then uh, that would be double counting. But we certainly want that to be true. And in fact, we could go a little stronger. I, I think I would be pretty happy if we could if we could say this: if E and F are in R, and uh, actually let, let me say instead of E and F, I'm going to go ahead and say if E sub one, E sub two, E sub three and so on. Keep going. Why not? Are all in R and pairwise disjoint. Then the measure of their union, the union from i equals 1 to infinity of e sub i, should just be the sum of all of their individual measures. The sum from i equals 1 to infinity of the measure of e sub i. That would make me happy because I, I feel like if we add up a bunch of individual things, let's say we have you know, e sub 1 here, and e sub 2 here, and e sub 3 here, and so on, then the measure, the total length, whether there are finitely many of them, or, or, or whether the length gets smaller and smaller and maybe gives us a finite total length, or whether their length is always uh, positive and of, of a great enough value that they add up to infinity, their, their total length should be the sum of all of the individual lengths, whether there are finitely many or countably many. So we call this property here sigma additivity, or, or countable additivity is another word. So that is one of the, the important properties that uh, measures need to have, and, and that's our, our, going to be our definition of a measure. So a measure I'm not going to fully define measure just yet, but but we'll 
to say a measure has what properties. It needs to have uh, the property that the measure of the empty set is zero, and it needs to have sigma additivity. Now, what there is one problem though, and the problem is that if we were to try to define the Lebesgue measure on R, we would run into a little bit of an issue. There would be some sets, at least if we accept the axiom of choice, some sets in this power set of R that don't have a measure. That if we try to assume that there is a measure defined on those sets, we get a contradiction. And I'll show you that in another video. But we need to, uh, and you, you can go ahead and watch that other video to show exactly why it's a problem. But because there are sets that have measures that have no measure at all, that we just can't define a measure, whether it's measure zero or measure anything else, it just can't be defined, it leads to a contradiction no matter what. So we can't have it be a function from the power set of R. So we can't say, oops. we can't let this measure, at least not all measures, maybe some measure could be a, from the power set to zero infinity, but certainly not all because the, the particular measure that we want to define won't work on the power set of the reals. That, that's supposed to be the power set of the reals there. So we need to uh, think about what sorts of properties we want this set to have. If it's not going to be the power set of the reals, it should be some subset of the power set of the reals, right? Some collection of sets. And let's see, what properties do we want this collection of sets to have? Well, if, it, if we're going to make any sense out of this sigma additivity, then we need to have that if we have we need to have the property that if a bunch of sets are in this collection, then their union is also in this collection, at least if they're pairwise disjoint. And we may as well go ahead and, and require that whether they're pairwise disjoint or not, if you have a bunch of sets, whether it's countably many or just finitely many, their union needs to be in the in the collection as well. So let's go ahead and require that. And we're going to call a, a collection of sets a sigma algebra if it has the, the following properties. A collection of subsets of R. And we could, instead of using R, we could use X. We could use any set, but uh, we could use Rn. But I'm just going to use R for now. Is called a sigma algebra. If it should probably contain the open set, I feel like that would be good. If one, it contains the open set. Now there's another property. We're, we're going to get to that sigma additivity thing uh, in, in just a second here. But but if I were to give you this set right here, and let's say that has it maybe this is I don't know maybe maybe this is x maybe this is but but I said x is all of R so let's not do that but let's say that this is some set that has a certain measure and then this is a subset of it that has a certain measure wouldn't it make sense that the measure of the the blue part right here if I, if I take the rest of it as blue wouldn't it make sense that the measure of the blue part is the measure of the entire red thing minus the brown part uh, I hope you understand what I'm trying to do here. It represents kind of this length up and down. So wouldn't it make sense that the measure of the blue part is the is the red part minus the brown part? Well, to get that, we need to to have complementation. So if th this brown part is E, we should have uh, the, the E complement. This this blue part should also be in our in our sigma algebra. So it needs to to have that property. And let's call our collection. We we should give our a name to our collection. Our collection is feeling very sad right now because it doesn't have a name. So we're going to call that collection F. We'll use some fancy cursive F. That was intended to be black. So some fancy cursive F. A collection F of subsets of R is called a sigma algebra if it contains the empty set. If I say open set, I meant empty set. And if E 
is an element of R, so E is a set, right? Then E complement is also in R. And then lastly, if E sub 1, E sub 2, and so on, are in, are in, keep writing the wrong thing here. Instead of R, I should have written F, right? That's what we're talking about, right? Our collection F of sets. So if E is in F, and then E complement is also in F. If E is in this collection, then its complement also needs to be in the collection as well. And then finally, if E sub 1, E sub 2, all the way down to E, well, keep going, a, a countably infinite number of these guys, then the union from I equals 1 to infinity of E sub I, that is, the union of all of these guys, is also in F. And those are the three properties that define a sigma algebra. And then, how are we going to define a measure then? Well, a set, a function, mu, from a sigma algebra f to uh, zero infinity is a measure. Oh, and by the way, I, I, I should probably mention that this collection has to be non-empty, a non-empty collection. If, if it's just the empty set, I'm not going to really call that a sigma algebra. That would be boring. So make it a non-empty collection. So f here is non-empty. There's actually something that the function does. It's a measure if, well, one, if f is a sigma algebra. And then if it has these, these properties that we, we said it needs to have. So it has the property of um, sigma additivity, and it has the property of the measure of the empty set equals zero. And that's why that's why a sigma algebra needs to contain the empty set, because if we uh, specify that the measure of the empty set needs to be zero, then we need to be able to take the measure of the empty set. Notice, by the way, if we have the empty set, we also have all of R, right? Because if the empty set is in our sigma algebra, then the complement of the empty set is also in our sigma algebra. But we don't need to specify that because it follows from the other axioms. All right, so the measure of the empty set is zero, and uh, mu is sigma additive. Those are our uh, the properties that define a measure. And then we'll go ahead and talk about in another video some other properties that follow from the definition of a measure. That's all for now. Hope you enjoyed watching.